Hello everyone, I am Sir Agamond, and welcome to my Divide and Conquer guide for the early game of Darwinian in version 5, which is currently unreleased, but it is in the beta, and at this moment, Darwinian is pretty much completely done, so there will be no more changes after this video, but of course that is subject to change, I can't say that for certain. Uh, my guides will offer strategies to succeed in the early stages of your campaigns, and I will also give you battlefield tips to defeat your initial enemies um, through your units' strengths, weaknesses, and counters, predominantly focusing on just the units that are available at the start of the campaign and not necessarily the later game units, as typically those are just upgrades to your existing units. So the same kind of uh, uses apply to those units as well. They're just a little more durable. Um, these guides aren't intended to be as in-depth as something like the guides that Arakir Galadurathan does on his channel, where he overviews the entire faction in-depth, as well as every single unit in-depth. Mine are going to be more of a... I want to keep mine a little bit different, so they'll be more strategy-focused, um, less lore, but a greater focus on setting up your game for success. Um, so without any further ado, let us begin. Um, today we will be doing the Vale of Darwinian, who is a nation of mixed races and cultures, both men and elves. So as such, uh, their military reflects this as well as their culture, and their strengths are pretty much as follows here in the overview. Um, they are a very well-rounded faction, um, very good in all regards, um, with their strengths being their very good trade. Um, they have excellent fertility in their heartland, so you can make a lot of money through farming. And uh, pretty much they ha their army consists of almost every unit type in the game, barring a few exceptions. Like you don't get any elephants, you don't get chariots, that sort of thing. Um, but they do have a few weaknesses, um, which is predominantly their split roster. You will not be able to field your entire roster, or... Well, you can, but you only get a limited number of the units that you do not make a choice for. So if you scroll down, you will see the um, elven and human choice. So if, depending on which side you choose, you will unlock military recruitment of more units. But the other side, you will only get a one-time army that consists of one of each of the other units. So if you pick humans, you'll get a spawned army later on that gives you one of each elven unit that you can't normally recruit. And vice versa. Another weakness they do have is that they are beset on three of the four cardinal directions by forces of evil and very powerful nations at that. So immediately to your east is the Easterlings of Rune, who have a very wide faction. I'll click on them here. So it, it, they only start with one province if you play as them, uh, but if you play as Darwinian, they will have pretty much everything around the Sea of Rune and to your south, so they have a very strong empire. Directly south of them is Mordor over here, and to your far west across the fields of Rovanion, you will find Dol Guldur, and quite often in your campaign you might find yourself fighting all three of those enemies. So that is their biggest weakness. Their allies are far to the north, up the river running, to Dale and Erebor. So now we are here on the campaign map, and if you are new to Divide and Conquer, I always recommend reading the initial message here, which will tell you all about the game and the features of the mod. So if you're new, you can find most of the answers to your questions found here. Um, so I always recommend reading through that if you are new, as I've said. So you'll also get a little pop-up that tells you more about your faction and who you are. A little bit of lore there can be a fun read. And then the t land of two people here is the introduction to the script for Darwinian. We won't go super in-depth through that, but you can read through those if you like. So you do have four settlements on the campaign map. You have Carasant, which is the City of Gardens. You have Sant Anhui, which is the Western Gardens. Uh, and then you have Strandost here. This is the City of the Northmen, I suppose. Um, it is in the south of your um, starting territory. And to the east you have Naburka, a small village on an island which is key and pivotal to the uh, amount of trade that you will get in this land. So initially here, um, I definitely recommend, in terms of build orders, I'd recommend turning Karasant into your economic hub. It can make lots of trade, pretty much the most out of any settlement you have, through both sea trade, land trade, and farming. Uh, I would definitely recommend probably prioritizing the farms and um, trade with this building, 
um, I mean with this capital. You can also go, it's never a bad idea to go with mason halls because they do reduce building times and building costs. So I, oft, I often like to go with these, um, but you don't have to if you don't want to. If you want to jump straight onto the farming or onto the trade, but you will save money and time with them. So it is important to know at the cost of initial income. So like I said, I'd probably recommend doing a mason's hall into grain exchanges, um, into communal farmings, eventually going into ports, but they do cost a lot more gold. So make sure you're ready for that. In the south here at Strandos, this is where I'd recommend getting uh, as much free upkeep as you can here. It is a very defensible location for basically the only way through is to cross this bridge and then go past the settlement itself. I don't believe, okay, you can actually walk through this, this path here, but you can guard the river crossing here. We have a fort for free um, upkeep for up to four units. And then in the castle, you only start off with one free upkeep unit. Um, but you can build a meeting hall to increase that, and that's what I'd recommend getting as much upkeep as you can here to keep the largest military presence you can. It also might not be a bad idea to go into siege weaponry. Let's see where is that? If I go to building browser, let's see here, it should be available. Oh yeah, it's right here, the ballista maker, and then upgrading that to the catapult maker, which does require leather worker. You can use the catapults and ballistas to very good effect by posting them on this bridge here and you will be able to kill lots of your enemy. You can see at the very beginning of the game, Rune does have a full army that is situated in Lest here. Um, they won't attack you straight off the bat, they will typically expand into the rebels, so what you can do is send your diplomat that you start with more away and get trade with Rune. That'll give you about 10, 15, maybe even 20 turns if you're lucky where they won't attack you. Um, and you can basically get more money because your ships will be trading with them and Strondost will connect to land trade with Lust, as well as another settlement that they have down this way. So I always recommend doing that. You will inevitably go to war with them. The only way to ally with them would be to send your diplomats all the way up north to where Dale and Erebor are and get um, basically break your alliances with them. Over here in Naburka, I typically would recommend not really worrying about this settlement too much unless you plan on building ships. That way you can stop Rune from actually engaging you here. Um, I would say your best bet is probably to get the meeting hall just right off the bat. That way your initial vine um, vineyard bowmen aren't costing you 160 gold each turn. That's probably the best way to save money here. And Athel here is a unique general. He does have Athala rangers, so they can defend this settlement. But uh, I typically wouldn't recommend investing too much money into it until you've expanded farther around the Sea of Rune. Or if you plan on getting a bunch of ships in this area to protect it because you won't be able to recruit many units. You will only be able to get the vineyard units from the meeting hall here. You can't recruit anything else until it goes up to 1200 population. So I typically just let it be for a while. Over here in Santon Wee, this is where I'd recommend focusing entirely on military. You can do that through great halls as well as leather workers. So I'd recommend getting your armor upgrades here. You actually already have your complete roster available here in Santa Anui. This is every single unit you get outside of mercenaries, so you can't upgrade your barracks or anything until you complete more of their script. So this is everything you see right here. It's a perfect settlement just to focus on leather tanners and meeting halls because eventually when you can upgrade your barracks, you're going to need a royal hall for the regent's armory and you're going to need a... Um, Royal Hall also for the Avari Armory, and I believe it goes one tier above that Actually, no, that is the last tier So you, you'll need to get this which is three upgrades on the meeting hall But you do get six upkeep slots or no recruitment slots and four upkeep slots So you'll be able to pump out a lot of soldiers from Santan Wee and of course with the leather tanner and armor upgrades You'll make your units much more survivable, which is also a good call to make so I would say to go with the Mason's Hall and then start working down the leather tanners. You can also get mines, you will get 300 gold from these as there is a gold resource right there. And you can also get mines in strong dust, I believe, which also gives you another 300 because it has gold right down here. So good to get mines in these two areas, good to get free upkeep in strong dust, and good to get the um, armories and leather tanners up here in Saint Tonui. Don't Don't get the armories actually, that would be these militia garrison buildings, but get the um, halls and uh, leather up there. So as for initial expansion, I would recommend taking Norway over here with his elves, and if you head just north and west here, you will encounter a province called Ilanan. 
I'd recommend immediately besieging this. You will lose some money, like right now, without building anything and just having these guys out here. We're losing 436 a turn, which isn't that bad. The garrison in here is actually very weak, though. You can just take it with Norway. If you want to make it a little bit easier, I'd recommend going to saint -Anui, training up one Thorn Rider, and then training up a Vineyard Levy, just so you have a little unit to basically garrison this settlement with. Um, you also have Vinelord Swain, your faction leader, with Thorn Bladesman and Thorn Crossbow to start with here. And over in Saint uh, Carasant, you just have some Vineyard Levies. You don't need to keep them here. You don't really need free upkeep at Carasant. You can just pull these guys either to the south if you want to reinforce it, or pull them to the west, which might be a better call. Over here in the fort, I'd recommend getting as many of your higher tier units as possible in it, rather than, um, you know, crappy militia. So we can basically just start this off. I'll do a sample build. I'm going to grab a Mason's Hall here, Mason's Hall and Karasant, and I'm going to go for the Meeting Hall right here in Strandos to get more free upkeep for this Thorn Bladesman here, because it does cost 230 a turn, so that'll save us some money. And in Aburka, we'll go for the Meeting Hall. You can turn up the taxes in Karasant all the way up to very high, but you won't get any population. I'd say probably high is a good place to go until you start getting more farms out here. Um, and then over here in Santon, we you could also recruit a third unit if you want to get Thorn Bladesman. It's definitely not a bad call. You do get plenty of free upkeep, so that'll be our example. And like I said, you can either um, siege the settlement out, that will take five turns, or you can attack it on the next turn. I would also recommend take Norway and use him as extensively as you can in this battle. Don't kill him off, but if you can get his soldiers down to 77, that'll save you about 100 gold on his upkeep there since bodyguards can only replenish up to 77 units um, and right now he's at 102. He's going to take casualties anyway um, but you, in my opinion it's better to just have these unique generals go out, lose some of their number and that'll save you some money in the long term. So from here uh, basically you'll play out the campaign. I'll go ahead and uh, toggle the fog of war. After you take a Alanan either with reinforcements or without, either besieging or not, your next step will be to Carverad. Now, I would recommend not really building anything in Alana, maybe just a meeting hall for some free upkeep, but just kind of let it sit there for extra trade with Saint Anui. Carverad is a very good settlement for both farms and uh, for trade, um, although it will only be trading with Alana and Saint Anui. So, basically, I recommend go for Alana, go for Carverad, and then go for Vilter over here. There are some rebel forces. So if you want, you could skip Vilter and go for Morned Hell, or do Vilter first and then go to Morned Hell, which is the most important city that you will have. This city is what unlocks your script and lets you make your choice between elven units or human units, as well as do you want more economy or a higher tier of smithing. Uh, the higher tier of smithing, of course, going with the elves, and the higher tier of economy going with the human choice. Um, Rune typically won't go up here, and if they do, the garrison is pretty strong and they'll end up just hurting themselves on it by throwing their bodies at it, making it ultimately easier for you to take it. Do know that the roads here are actually the highest tier of roads, and I don't believe you can actually build these yourself. Let's see, if we go to roads, yeah, you actually can't. Those are the trade routes, which are actually a Numenorean level road here. So this place has the best roads in all of basically the east here, although I think perhaps Rune can also go up to that level. I can't recall exactly, but I think they can. Um, I do not recommend going east or west to Rawberg. It is just a village. It will be hard to defend. Um, and I, Logarth isn't a bad idea. It is a castle, so you can put a garrison here. But if you expand too far west, you're going to have a very long border with Rune. On the turn 2 auto expansion, Rune will have Ost and Arai. Barfest, and then Emedha, Mataram, Grubar, and Algyre here. They won't have Winteria and Eeyore, but I typically ignore that because you can't walk up here. It takes 10 turns to walk up to this settlement because you have to go all the way over here. Unless you make boats, of course, but typically Rune won't be coming up this way on you. If you want to, get a, get a boat and send some units to this free upkeep fort over there. And, um... I think that pretty much does it for the campaign map, as I said, go for Vilter after Carverad and then go for Morned Hell. By that time it should be about 20 to 25 turns in, and at that point um, you will predominantly just be fighting Rune and trying to invade their heartland. Do be, do be wary though, 
you do have this um, choke point here that you can defend from, but the farther west you go, this is all just open plains and open land. So you're going to want to have either a good watchtower system, or you're going to want to have multiple spies out here scanning for runic armies, because I have had instances where I've left a settlement undefended, and I moved on to the next one, and suddenly, next thing I know, there is a runic army that is now besieging me in Vilter or in Lagarth because I didn't have enough vision in this area. And it is very wide, so it is tough to do that. You can try to go all the way west and circle around at Dorthalu and then kind of just encroach on Rune from this direction. But I find it easier just to go straight down from Vilter to Ostin Orion Farfest and ignore all of this here. Do note when you take Varfest, you will border Mordor, though. Uh, but it is a very important castle to take because you can pump out a lot of troops there and get free upkeep. Castles are very good for military, I always keep that in mind. You can also just rush straight for Lust and Mistrand. If you do take Mistrand though early, that will trigger a last stand army for Rune, so be prepared to fight that. An alternate method would be to sail up and around and take the entire Sea of Rune. If you do that, you will make loads of money. All of these settlements are very rich from trade. So now we will go and transition to the battle map where I will go over your early game roster, which is all of these units here, what they're good at, and uh, what they're weak against when you fight Rune. So I will see you guys on the battle map. Alright, and to start off with the first of our units here, we will have the Vineyard Levies and the Vineyard Bowmen. Um, but these are basically your militia units. They're pretty poor in quality, however they do compete decently well against Rune. The good units, the Vineyard Bowmen are actually have a lot of uses. They are weak archers, but they do have two missile attack and three defense, and there is a lot of them. They're good at countering the Daratai Hunters that Rune will send at you, as they do have one more defense than these four saps over here. Um, however, don't expect them to do anything to many shielded units or to any heavy units that Rune may field, but I do find them to be pretty effective. They trade very well with Daratai Hunters, they will lose out to Kondish Hunters because Kondish Hunters will have shields. They won't beat those units and of course keep them away from any cavalry and infantry they will lose. Your other unit is of course the Vineyard Levies. The only unit in Ruin's roster that these units will win against will be the Grunic Dragon Riders which are mounted medium cavalry of Ruin. They will lose that, they will only win that um, at a very it'll be very costly for them. They'll only have a few soldiers remaining in most of my tests that I have performed, and they will lose to Daratai Clansmen, which is Rune's early game uh, militia unit. They do have higher attack and about the same defensive stats, so you will lose out to those, but they are very good, they are cheap, and they can pad out your lines and protect you from cavalry. If you ever just need some soldiers to stand and get shot, or to stand and block some cavalry, these guys will do the job very well for you. Just don't expect them to do much offensively. In all of my tests, like I said, the only unit in Rune's roster that they will beat will, of course, be the Runic Cavalry. Anything in melee, though, will, of course, beat them, so they get countered by Daratai Clansmen and anything heavier duty than them. Uh, but they are very cheap and cost-effective. Just don't let them get shot in the back like you are seeing here. Perhaps the most important unit, in my opinion, for Darwinian's early game. These are the Thorn Bladesmen, and these are your bread and butter. I always recommend always having these guys in any army you can. For after some testings, I have found that they have they pretty much beat one-on-one -on -one almost every single unit that Rune can send at you in the early game. The only things that they can't beat are the Aralad Dragon Guard, the Far Rune Mercenaries, although that is a mercenary unit, so does it really count? And the Dragon Riders. However, they only lose against the Dragon Riders if they are not using their Shield Wall ability, and this ability is very, very good for multiple reasons. When they're in this Shield Wall, they can tank on a cavalry charge from almost anything with very few casualties, so it is very good on the defense, but don't think that this ability is purely defensive. Or should you want to have a unit in shield wall fight something like these Daratai warriors who they will beat no matter what, this will allow them to basically tank directly into the enemy. Now what I mean by that is simply done by showing it in action. So on the charge they won't do that much damage here since it's a very tight formation, but if you want to you can force your way through with a shield wall and start sending the enemy flying basically. 
the Thorn Bladesman will just cut a clear path through the enemy just like this. This is most effective against pikemen uh, and halberds as well because they can just dive in. But as you can see, like they, they just get completely squished here. And the unit um, is very, very good. Of course, I wouldn't really recommend using shield roll just on anything. Typically, save it for something that is either that you outnumber or something that is weaker than you. In this case, the Daratai Warriors, the Thornblademen, do win this fight without shield wall. So it wasn't the best example, but it is still something that gives them a lot of utility. These men will beat Klansmen, Balkoth Spearmen, Balkoth Tribesmen, even after they throw their three javelins. Daratai Warriors, and they will even beat the Lokrim Bodyguards. So if you don't have anything decent to send at the Runic Bodyguards, or even a General, just send in a unit of Thorn Bladesmen, and they will not let you down. They will nearly die. Like, the Bodyguard is just so far above them in terms of tier. But if they can push into the enemy, uh, and into a Bodyguard, they will eventually kill a General and survive themselves, so... I was very surprised at the effectiveness of these units in my test. I didn't expect them to do as well as they did. Even against these um, Darta Warriors who have one more attack than them but one less defense, the Thorn Bladesmen will prevail. So I always recommend getting this unit whenever you can. I would recommend them over the Vineyard um, Levy Spearmen um, unless you specifically just need to pad out the numbers. Well, like I said, this unit also with the shields, they'll be able to withstand arrow fire from Daratai Hunters and even the Daratai Crossbows, all of that's kind of pushing their capability there. Like I said, get plenty of these guys and if you can, give them the armor upgrades to make them perform even better. And moving on to our next unit, we do have the Thorn Guard. Now these guys, they do look like long spears, but they are actually functioning like halberds. They can form a spear wall, which is not a formation I typically recommend using, and I'll explain why later. They are effective against armor, and they do have relatively okay defense, but a low attack of 3 and okay morale. These guys struggle to win against most matchups that they find themselves in, however, I have found them, Halberds in general, to be particularly effective when it comes to fighting Spearmen. So as such, the Thorngard will defeat Baltroth Spearmen, um, and they will of course beat Daratai Clansmen, but pretty much any other infantry that they fight, they will lose to. And against Cavalry, they are not meant to take charges. They can, they're best used to charge into cavalry after the cav is fighting something else or to support a cav engagement. But if they are to take a charge, they will suffer horribly. And I actually did do multiple tests with and without spear wall on, with and without guard mode on, and I could not find a particularly effective way to utilize the spear wall. As you see here, they get charged by the runic dragon riders, and many of these thorn guards just fall directly on the charge. That one took out just about 40 of them instantly, and they haven't even killed hardly any of the Dragon Guard. Of course, as the Dragon Guard stay in melee, they will take losses. So in a sustained fight, they will win, but they cannot take any charges at all. I've even had them directly lose. What I have found about Spear Wall is that it does not work if you put them in guard mode. So make sure that your units aren't in guard mode when they're in Spear Wall, and they perform a little better than if they are in guard mode. Against infantry, I found that not even having them in spear wall at all is even more effective than that. Just make sure you do not charge into cavalry, like make sure that they are static if you have to take a charge. But as you can see here, it is not a good trade. 20 dragon riders to 60 thorn guard. And if the AI here is smart enough, they will repeatedly cycle charge us to death. They do have some uses against the more heavily armored units of rune, and of course if you give them armor they will function better than what they are here. All of these tests will be considering the units at their base stats beyond um, before any upgrades. So don't expect them to beat any infantry other than the spearmen or the armsmen without being supported, but they do fill a nice niche in being able to fight against the heavy cavalry as long as they don't get charged. And of course they don't have any missile resistance at all, so don't let these guys get shot. Make sure you cover them with your archers. Now moving on to our next unit and our first crossbow unit and only crossbow unit of this video. They do have one more, but we won't be considering them as they're the same kind of tactics apply here. The thorn crossbowmen are pretty weak in melee, but they do have an armor piercing bolt as all crossbow do in this game. However, I consider them to be a very situational unit and not something that you should field a lot of unless you are 
confident with your abilities in using crossbowmen, I would rather recommend putting in a few units of vineyard archers over the thorn crossbowmen unless you're fighting a few key targets. So they are very well and effective at countering the one Grunic infantry unit that almost none of your infantry can beat, and that is of course the Aralad Dragon Guard. They are your best damage dealer against the Dragon Guard. They will get loads of kills before they even get them in range here thanks to their armor piercing. But their slow reload speed um, does make them pretty vulnerable to counter charges and to cavalry, and they will not win any archer, archer duels at all. They will actually lose to Daratai Clansmen when in just a straight up um, shootout. Or not the Clansmen, but the Daratai Archers. They do have also uses against the Runic Generals because their bodyguard is so small. So they're good at sniping out and making little execution squads. But I recommend use them specifically against Dragon Guard if you have no other targets or into Daratai Warriors. But stay away from anything that is shielded and don't expect them to do too much against any um light infantry or archers that they can field they have their uses but they are very situational i'd recommend only having one or two per army and of course once they get into combat well you'll see yeah it does not bode well for the um thorn crosswoman at all they are just not meant to fight anything in melee and now onto our next unit, we do have the Thorn Riders. They are a pretty average cavalry, but they do have a spear and a shield. They will not win against the Aralad Dragon Riders, but I have found that their best use is actually to fight Kondish Raiders, since their shield will protect them from their arrows, and they are fast enough to typically catch up to the Raiders when they aren't moving. Sometimes you can catch them before they can escape and skirmish out, and if you get the charge off, just as we have done here, they will win this fight. If they don't get their charge off though, they typically tend to lose this engagement. So it's kind of hit or miss, but it is the only way that you're going to be able to catch up to Condus Raiders such as this. And of course, being cavalry, they are great at chasing down routing units, fighting archers, and fighting um, infantry by charging into them from the rear. But of course, do keep them away from any heavy, heavy infantry or spearmen. And whatever you do, keep them away from javelins, as javelins will just completely destroy them. Onto our next unit, we do have Darwinian Infantry, now increasing in quality. This is a mixed unit of both men and elves. They are pretty good spearmen, and they will actually beat most of Rune's weaker units, all the way up to the Daratai Warriors. However, they do struggle against the Aralad Dragon Guard. Their only real weaknesses being that they aren't good against anything of, with armor, of course, as they are just spears, so against late game Rune, um, don't expect them to do too much killing, but they will hold very well. And of course they are spearmen, so try to use them to shoot at ca or to guard against cavalry. They do have a shield wall, and anytime you can, I recommend using shield wall to block enemy charges. It's especially good against cavalry. And so even against these Daratai warriors, they will beat them. It will be a close fight, but for spears against guys with two swords, it is not a bad trade at all. Use these guys whenever you can, and they will not let you down. And onto our two-handed units, we have the Darwinian Armsmen, another mixed unit of both men and elves. You can see that they have different swords and different armor that they you can use to differentiate between them. These are essentially shock infantry and best used on the charge, either flanking or charging head-on, but do keep in mind that their defensive stats leave a little bit to desired as it is mostly armor, so keep them away from anything armor-piercing. They will beat all of the runic infantry one on one, but without, they will of course take some losses. And they will however lose to the Aralad Dragon Guard. You do not have any infantry that will beat the Dragon Guard, um, so always keep that in mind that you will need to use archers or cavalry charges or support to beat them one on one. But they do start off the fight with a higher charge, so they will get a lot of kills in the initial engagement, but over time in the grind they will lose this sort of engagement. So, they're best used, like I said, rear charging the enemy as kind of a poor man's hammer and anvil. And finally, functioning as a direct upgrade to the Darwinian Armsmen, we have the High Paladins, and these are also your general's bodyguard unit. As you can see, same type of unit with a two-handed weapon, high charge, high attack, but not armor piercing. They have amazing morale, and they will cut through swaths of Easterlings, like butter and a hot knife. You know that they are also the last of your mixed units, so you do have elves rocking that sweet elven armor, and then 
Northmen with their elaborate golden merchant armor. They will perform very well, and they will even beat the runic general, the Lok Gamprim, or the uh, Lok Rim bodyguard, in a one-on-one -on -one fight, if you can get the charge off. Um, it is a very close fight, but it was one that surprised me in my unit test that on average that they did win this fight, even though the Lok Rim bodyguard do have armor piercing and a relatively high attack stat of 12 in comparison to the 14 of the high paladins. Overall, a very good unit, and you will be seeing a lot of it should you decide to use your um, generic Northmen generals over your Elven generals in your campaigns. They will not let you down. Do keep them away, though, from armor piercing, from any Udej Marines, and of course, cavalry charges will do a number to them as they do not have any charge resistance outside of their armor, and they don't have any bonuses against cavalry either. But other than that, seeing that they did beat the Runic Bodyguard, that was a big surprise to me, but it is a very fun fight nonetheless, and one that I am glad that our men and elves of Darwinian can fight against and win. And our final unit for today is, of course, the Thorn Patrollers, a very special unit. They are one of only two crossbow cavalry units in the entire game, the others belonging to Moria, which are warg riding crossbow orcs. The Thorn Patrollers function pretty much identically to the Thorn Crossbowmen on foot. However, they do have just about half the soldiers, but they do have one more missile attack, so they have half the number of missiles, but they do get one more missile attack, so I'm not going to do the math on that. It's still worse than the Crossbowmen, but they do have a few advantages, and one being their speed, which completely counters the um, uses, like the weaknesses of the crossbows. They can fire and move. Um, so they don't have to worry about being vulnerable. They do suffer from low accuracy though. I find their best use is to be against either Dragon Riders or against the Locrim Bodyguard who can't hope to catch up to them and they can simply shoot until they are dead. Another advantage of them is that they can simply post up behind an infantry unit and thanks to their elevated position, they can simply just shoot up and over um, the enemy. So if you have like some vineyard levies or some thorn guard posted right in front of them in a spear wall they will be able to shoot just above their heads thanks to their elevated firing position not the um not the most devastating unit of course they will lose to condish archers the horse archers that is they won't be able to compete with their rate of fire and of course they are wasted on anything with light armor but the fact that they can fire in 360 degrees with a armor piercing weapon makes them have a very niche role on the battlefield I would definitely recommend having these guys over the um, unmounted version of the crossbowmen. Sure, you lack the firepower, but you do get the utility in having a unit that can chase down fleeing enemies here. And of course, they can just decimate the Locrum bodyguard who can't even catch them. They definitely have their uses, but watch out for arrow fire. Watch out for runic archers and runic cavalry should they get engaged. They will not win any fight if they are charged, and they will not win against runic crossbowmen. But they still have their uses and are very versatile. 10 out of 10 would recommend. Anyway guys, I hope that has been useful to you guys in how to play the early game as Darwinian. It is of course not the um, hardest campaign. I would say it's one of the more beginner friendly ones. Just do expect to be fighting lots of battles against the Easterlings. They do like to spam a lot of soldiers. But as I have demonstrated in this video and from my personal experience, you do have all the tools that you need to combat Rune, and even going into the late game, all you're doing is dealing with units that have more armor, and you still have options there. Like I said, the Thorn Crossbowmen, more of a unit that is suited for the late game campaigns, um, once Rune starts fielding its golden elites. Um, other than that, I definitely recommend having Vineyard Archers since they are cheap and plentiful. And as I said, you should be able to find yourself relatively easy success as Derwinian. There's not much that can go wrong in the campaign unless you purposely mess it up, or should Rune just decide to immediately send that army from Lest on you. But I have never seen that happen in any of my numerous campaigns. I would definitely put Derwinian on the easier scale, but hopefully the build orders and expansion guides will help you guys. Um, in your version 5 campaigns and do of course remember that in version 5 there is no barracks event you will just have to simply build meeting halls in order to unlock new tiers of your barracks but Darwinian does have the advantage in that they only need one single um, military building they do not have a split recruitment so all of their archers cavalry and infantry will all come from the same 
one building called the Thorn Armor. You do not need to build stables, barracks, or ranges. It's all in one, which gives you a pretty good advantage as Darwinian. So this has been Sir Agamond, and I will see you guys on the next one.